Coming up next on Making Moves. JTA partners with the world's largest tire company to test new airless tires on its autonomous vehicles. Wow, beautiful engineering floor that's clean, multiple vehicles, you got the toolkits. Uh, engineering dream, right, facility right here. And then uh, the team, Jacksonville's team, brought us back here, showed us the simulated route. Like, this is exactly what Goodyear is looking for. 50 years ago, transportation in Jacksonville changed forever. And it all started with a name. We'll have the story of how JTA became JTA. If you live in Florida, hurricanes are always a threat. Eugene Lindsay shows us what you need to be ready for the next big storm. Families and, and businesses and communities that take the time to prepare, we know that they come out of those disasters um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially better off. JTA has one of the most robust DBE programs you will find anywhere. We talk with a local woman-owned business that got an opportunity to lead a key Jacksonville construction project, thanks to JTA and how it's helped grow their business. And JTA is hiring. Find out how you can join one of the most revered transportation agencies in the country. These stories and more are all coming up right now on this brand new episode of Making Moves. Welcome to Making Moves. I'm Bill Milnes. Thanks for being with us today. We begin with the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Goodyear has a history that goes back into the late 1800s. And over the years, they've changed the course of transportation with numerous innovations. The world's largest tire company, Goodyear, produced the first tubeless tire, the first synthetic rubber tire, and who could forget the famed Goodyear blimp? So it should come as no surprise that Goodyear has developed a new airless tire for use on public transit vehicles. And when they wanted to do real-world testing for the first time anywhere, Goodyear came here to Jacksonville to work with the JTA and its autonomous vehicle fleet. Here's Mickey Moose correspondent David Cotton with more on this unique partnership. This is where we're going to start the 45-minute lecture <laughs> on the nonlinear mechanics that go in to make something like this a reality. Uh, it is no easy task. An industry first, and a first for Jacksonville. Right, this, this is a hard problem to solve. The JTA and Goodyear are teaming up to take tire technology for a new spin with Goodyear's non-pneumatic tire and wheel assembly on the local motor's Ali 2.0 autonomous shuttle. This tire is completely airless, and for the first time ever, it's hitting the road on a public transportation vehicle. It's a product for its purpose. It's designed for this purpose. Autonomous shuttles at low speeds in an urban metro setting or on a college campus or on a national park, right? There's lots of good use cases. Other than the rubber tread on the outside, this new tire is a departure from what you'll see on a JTA bus or your own car. For the JTA, this project is the latest in a line of innovative partnerships for its autonomous vehicle program as it develops the ultimate urban circulator. We've made significant progress in terms of identifying the JTA and Jacksonville as a hub of autonomous vehicle technology and development. JTA CEO Nat Ford joined officials from Goodyear, Beep, and Local Motors in July to unveil this new technology at the Authority's Armsdale AV Test and Learn Center. We were a startup co company 120 years ago in 1898, saw a transformation in the transportation industry, which was from horses to motorized vehicles, and Goodyear was there as a startup and took a spirit of innovation and technology all the way through. And that's what we see right here with thought leaders like Beep and Local Motors and Jacksonville, what you're doing to encourage and enable that. We want to be a part of that and we want to find solutions that help that in that startup spirit. Michael Rakita is Goodyear's senior program manager for the MPT. He says JTA's test and learn tracks at Armsdale and Cecil present new challenges and opportunities to learn more about this emerging tech. 
This is exactly what Goodyear is looking for uh, in terms of a test and learn, get in the wild, be aggressive, right? Go ahead, put it hard through the paces of all these simulated stops and turns and the bus station. The MPTs are now driving with the Ali 2.0, Local Motors 3D printed autonomous shuttle. Beep and Local Motors together uh, have been working with Jacksonville, right? JTA to figure out how do we become part of this test and learn facility. So that's what all came together. For the U.S.-based AV manufacturer, Jacksonville provides a hub for testing, deployment, and innovation. It's become a very progressive, collaborative environment where we are learning from each other and enhancing the feature set of the, of the mobility solution. Over the next 6 to 12 months, the Ali and its new shoes will go through rigorous testing to see how the tires hold up in a public transit environment. Unlike your car or truck, a public bus, or in this case, an autonomous vehicle, is much heavier. It drives further and for longer hours each day, meaning the testing going on here in Jacksonville will most certainly have implications for the rest of the country. For JTA Making Moves, I'm David Gaud. 50 years ago, something extraordinary happened in Jacksonville. On September 1st, 1971, the Jacksonville Transportation Authority officially became the public transit provider for the city. But as you're about to hear, how that became reality and what happened next is the real story. In the early 1900s, Jacksonville was home to one of only two electric streetcars in the United States. But by the 1940s, it was all about buses when the Jacksonville Coach Company began and then expanded the following year after acquiring the assets of Orange Lines and merging with the Motor Transit Company. Two years later, it merged again, this time with the Beach Motor Transit Company. Then in 1952, the Jacksonville Coach Company was purchased by the City Coach Lines, which also operated transit systems in Michigan and North Carolina. Three years later, in 1955, the Florida State Legislature created the Jacksonville Expressway Authority to build the expressway system in and around the Jacksonville area. It was also responsible for building several bridges, like the Hart Bridge into downtown. Public transit was still the domain of private industry. Over the next two decades, however, as ownership in the automobile continued to increase, bus ridership was rapidly declining. The federal government couldn't assist private companies with public tax dollars, so instead it began planning the development of urban transit systems across the country. Here in Florida, the legislature determined in Jacksonville that task would go to the Expressway Authority. So on September 1st, 1971, 50 years ago, its name was officially changed to the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. But JTA was a transit agency in name only. It had no vehicles. When a fare increase by the coach company further eroded its ridership, Jacksonville Mayor Hans Tanzler pushed for JTA to take over transit operations in Jacksonville. 15 months and 10 days after it became the Jacksonville Transportation Authority, JTA acquired the rolling stock and all assets of the coach company, including 157 buses, land and building for maintenance, storage and operations. The total price was just over $3 million, with the federal government paying two-thirds of the cost. Florida Department of Transportation and the Jacksonville City Council each paid a half a million dollars to make up the balance. JTA immediately began to tweak the system making improvements, adding service, and reducing fares. The result was a 10% increase in ridership its first month in operation compared to the previous year. Now, 50 years later, the JTA is one of the most respected, innovative transit agencies in the country and is currently leading the wave of autonomous vehicle technology in the public sector. As part of this transition from the Expressway Authority to the Transportation Authority, JTA held a design contest to create a new logo for the newly named agency. The winner was John Kaysen, a local college student. Kaysen, seen here in this image with then JTA Chairman Wesley Paxson and Bus Operator of the Year John Boxley, was awarded a full month bus pass on JTA for his winning entry. JTA continues to use an updated version of John's design to this very day. Up next on Making Moves. With the tropical storm Elsa scare behind us, isn't it time to make sure you're prepared for the next big storm? 
Eugene Lindsay talks to the experts to ensure you have everything you need. How JTA is helping women and minority-owned businesses get ahead. And we check on the progress of America's first turbo roundabout being built by JTA in Arlington. That's all next when Making Moves continues. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. I don't think that many kids in my son's school even do it. He makes fun of his friend who vapes. He would never try it. She's in the soccer. She's on the honor roll. She's just on the tight. No way. No way. No way. No way. My kid would never vape. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping. Maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. When I was your age, I was just like you, fascinated by stars. <sighs> but now I get to search for life in the universe. And who knows, maybe life is looking for us too. So we're like aliens to them? Yeah. Does anyone want to be a scientist now? I do. Awesome. We need more girls in STEM. Maybe we can find aliens. You're watching Making Moves, the most honored transportation news and information program of its kind in the country. Welcome back to Making Moves. Hurricane Elsa gave everybody in Florida a bit of a scare before being downgraded to a tropical storm as it made its way north through the state. This early season hurricane was a good reminder that we must always be vigilant when it comes to these storms, especially when you live here in Florida. Making Moves correspondent Eugene Lindsay joins us now from the newsroom Eugene, if Elsa showed us anything, it's that it's never really too early to get prepared. For sure, Bill, it certainly is not. The time to get prepared for a hurricane is well before there's even a potential hurricane strike in the forecast. So while all is quiet and there are no long lines at stores and gas pumps, it's the perfect time to stock up on all of those much needed supplies before we're suddenly in the crosshairs of a hurricane. A hurricane can be an ominous force of nature. A Category 1 hurricane can pack wind speeds up to 95 miles per hour. And a Category 5 blusters in raging rain and wind speeds starting at 157 miles per hour. But no matter the forecast category, a hurricane should not be taken lightly. All are capable of bringing damaging winds with heavy rains, spawning tornadoes, flooding, and major storm surges. And we are already nearly three months into the 2021 Atlantic hurricane season with five named storms already crossed off the list. So are you prepared should a hurricane head our way? Experts say, don't wait. Now is the time to prepare before a hurricane sets its aim in our direction. So what do you do? Exactly how do you properly prepare for tropical storm season? Well, first and foremost, you must have a plan. You can have the best kit with all the water and food and snacks and all the things you need, but if you don't have a plan, the kit's not as valuable. Christian Smith, Chief Development Officer for the American Red Cross North Florida Region says that plan is all about making decisions for you and your family. Will you stay in your home or will you evacuate? Will you go stay with a friend or relative or will you seek refuge in a shelter? And if you stay at home, have you designated a safe room? 
an interior place in your house that you know is the most structurally sound place to ride out the storm if necessary. So first and foremost is making the decision, sitting down with your family and putting together that plan. And then you get to do the fun stuff, which is making the kit. And when it comes to building your hurricane kit, first on the list is water. Smith says you'll want to have on hand at least one gallon of water per person per day. You also want to think about, you know, the kinds of things that you're going to um, put in there as well. You know, maybe it's peanut butter and things like um, that you can eat, the tuna fish, um, any canned meats, um, lots of things. We do a lot of SpaghettiOs because those you don't have to, to warm up and you can eat right out of the can. Talk with your family. Pick those items that they like, preferably things you can eat right out of a can. And when it comes to buying food and groceries for your hurricane kit, you'll want to do it while the shelves are well stocked and your favorite non-perishable food items are in good supply. If you decide to wait until that last minute rush, you may feel forced to purchase whatever is left behind. When you're thinking about those kinds of foods, if you don't like Spam today or if you don't like SpaghettiOs today, you're not going to like them when there's a disaster. It's beautiful outside. It's great weather. This is the time now while, while things are calm before the storm to go to the store, you know, go to your local Winn-Dixie, get those buy one, get one free, buy two, get one free. Sometimes it's buy one, get two free, whatever the case may be, but get those things now. And once you have your water and food supply well stocked, Smith says you'll want to have copies of all of your important papers, information that represent who you are and what you own, like homeowners and renters insurance, social security cards, driver's license, and birth certificates. You may need this information to get access back into your community and to file insurance claims. And don't forget about your medication. Red Cross officials recommend that you have at least a two-week supply on hand. If it's something that you take and that's life-saving, then you need to make sure that that's in your kit and you have those things ready. When dixie pharmacist Adam Kelly says he's seen firsthand the dramatic surge in medication refills when a hurricane threatens to come our way. We have a great increase in volume, and what I would encourage people to do is don't wait till the last minute. Always keep track of how much medication you have. Don't let it run till you're all the way out. And Kelly also says to keep in mind that some medications must be kept at room temperature at the very least. You want to make sure that you have a cooler for your insulins because if that power goes out, it's going to get hot really fast. And insulin has to be at least room temperature to be good for 28 days. It's going to get hotter than that in the house, so make sure you have a cooler and you have an action plan set up to where you're going to store your insulin should the power go out. In addition to your medications, it's important not to forget about vaccines. From COVID-19 to tetanus, from pneumonia to the shingles vaccine, make sure that you're protected ahead of time. Don't wait. And of course, to round out your hurricane kit, you'll want to make sure you have a radio flashlights and plenty of batteries. Smith says once you've created your hurricane supply kit, you'll want to store everything in a waterproof bin. Then in case if you have to ride out the storm in just one room of your house or if you have to evacuate, then you can just grab it and go. Now, Bill, what we talked about here are the things that you want to be mindful of and really the must-haves for your hurricane kit as you ride out the storm and the things that you'll need for survival and comfort days after a hurricane. Now, Smith also says now, before a hurricane threatens, to go ahead and purchase your plywood for boarding up your windows if that's something that you're planning on doing. And go ahead and get your gas cans and generators because once there's a hurricane on the horizon, these items can suddenly become very hard to come by. Bill? Good advice. Eugene, thank you. You won't find many women in the construction field. There are even fewer who own construction companies. So getting contracts and growing your business can be a challenge. But program like JTA's Disadvantaged Business Enterprise, or DBE, is helping to break down those barriers and create new opportunities. Making Moves correspondent Vicki Pierre talks with Erica Gonzalez of Mayor Construction about how leading construction on JTA's Fifth Street project has created new growth for her company. Looking at this construction site or any other, it's easy to assume that you'll only see men at work or in charge. But here on 5th Street, that isn't the case. You guys going to backfill everything today and get all your densities? Yes, okay. We are improving the drainage, the utilities, and the roadway because the, there was a big drainage problem between 
um, the houses and the roadway, and then the road needed to also be improved. That's Erica Gonzalez, and she's the owner of Mayor Construction. That day, that, that Sunday that it rained like the six inches, me and Michael came over here, and this whole neighborhood was flooded. When JTA officials decided it was time to make some much needed drainage, utility and roadway improvements to this stretch of 5th Street, they put out bids for the prime contractor. In the end, it was Mayer, a woman owned construction firm that won out. This is the water that they're using right now, yeah. this line right here. And that's how I got to cut it out and remove it. It feels good to grow and get bigger and be able to get the bigger, like a bigger job like 5th and McDuff so that you know you're growing and you're doing something right. Gonzalez, who runs the company with her husband, says that in terms of price, this is the firm's biggest contract to date. It's an opportunity that comes thanks to the authority's DBE or Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, along with their work with this man. We are very proud in terms of what we've been able to do with women-owned businesses. Ken Middleton is JTA's Director of Diversity, Equity, and Customer Advocacy. He says the DBE program is run federally by the U.S. Department of Transportation with the goal of helping more minority and women-owned businesses gain work as either prime contractors or subcontractors on projects. That is some of the major objectives of the DBE program and, uh, to level the playing field. Prior to the DBE program, Oftentimes, small businesses weren't aware of contract opportunities, whereas now, you know, part of what my office is tasked with is getting the word out. As his office gets the word out to companies like Mayer, they're also helping them go through the process of getting DBE certified. That includes ensuring that they meet the criteria set out by the program. In fact, Middleton worked closely with Gonzalez and Mayer to help them gain certification. As these small women and minority owned businesses get certified, they're able to bid on jobs and contracts with JTA and other transportation agencies, often for the first time. Can I take off my hard hat now? I'm like sweating. JTA has a, a very rich and proud history of working uh, in the uh, small business and minority communities, supporting uh, uh, a lot of the different projects and all that we have. The DBE program isn't just about creating opportunities, it's also creating new jobs. Middleton says as more small businesses are working with JTA, they're able to hire on additional people, which is exactly what happened with Mayer. They were able to hire five additional employees. You're going to go do the storm after that? Yes, I'll start the storm here. As for the job here on 5th, Gonzalez says she feels a sense of accomplishment, and it isn't simply working hard and in earning this contract. So our relationship with JTA um, has been really good because they're very hands-on, they're local to us, so it's really been great to deal with them because of their local presence here and the ease of doing the job because they're such a hands-on relationship with us. Has Joe already done the water down here on this end? Yeah, one. Oh, on the other side. But Gonzalez says it's also in having the opportunity to partner with more agencies like JTA, doing the work she believes will make a difference on these roads and for these families. I'm hoping that it really makes a difference for the people that live there because they needed the improvements and it should help. In West Jacksonville, Vicki Pierre, JTA Making Moves. Now an update on a couple JTA construction projects, one in Arlington and one on the west side. At the Merrill Road and University Boulevard intersection at the entrance to Jacksonville University, JTA is installing a turbo roundabout. This will be the first turbo roundabout anywhere in the U.S. Through the planning and study process, we realize the signals that are there are presenting a safety hazard because people want to, they can get great speeds through this thing to make the light, for example. Um, a normal roundabout just wouldn't handle the traffic. And so the turbo roundabout would provide both of the things, the safety features of a normal roundabout plus the efficiency of the signalized inter intercession. Meanwhile, at FSCJ's Kent campus in Avondale, JTA is moving, reconstructing and expanding the transit hub at the school. The Kent campus hub currently serves routes 5, 51 and 80. The new expanded hub will be located closer to the school's Park Street entrance. In economic news, JTA is currently hiring for several full-time positions. There are openings currently available in administration, payroll, Skyway maintenance, community outreach, and bus operations, including driver positions. 
To apply for any of these jobs, visit the JTA website at jtafla.com and click on the careers link at the top of the page. Before we go, we want to share our final installation in our season-long Art in Motion series. Today we feature textile artist Ayana Nakia, who began designing at an early age. Now she focuses on turning remnants from others into artwork with soul. With House of Remnant Soul, I use remnant pieces and I add soul to it. So what you may think is trash, I can turn it into treasure. Since I was a little girl, I was always designing clothes, earrings. I was one of those children that if I made something, asking you, can you wear it? <laughs> you know, whether it looked cool or not, it, you know, your parents would never turn you down. Um, but I say around maybe 10, I started um, drawing and designing clothes. I get my talents from my father. He was an architectural draftsman. So I would try to mimic what he would do, like the blueprints for buildings and self-portraits. I started um, sewing and using pieces of material. And so from there, I kind of grew into my craft, designing earrings and clothes and accessories. And then I started moving towards putting them on the canvas. Sankofa is you learn your past so you can move forward. And that's what this piece is, design your own pattern in life. And that is like my hashtag, meaning that we just take pieces from each part of our history. So something from your grandparents, your mother, whoever, whatever elder, your teachers, things of that nature. And you just wove it into your own pattern and you move forward with that. to have a lot of organizations, especially JTA as a transportation company, invest in the arts. You're investing also in the youth coming up. It's an opportunity um, for people to come together, maybe recognize the names, reach out to that person, help that person in some type of way. With the art, it's something physical that you can actually touch and look at and say, oh wow, let me see what this artist is about or let me see how we can reach out to the community and put money back within the community. And that wraps up this episode of Making Moves. We thank you for joining us and welcome you to check out our YouTube channel where you can watch past episodes and stories at your leisure. A direct link to our YouTube page is available at jtafla.com. Just click on the YouTube icon at the bottom of the page. I'm Bill Millis for everyone here at Making Moves. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time for our season 13 finale.